We had aggressive begging everywhere, and we had every day on average 60 or 70 serious felony crimes, including robbery, stabbings, 22 murders mm -hmm. in 1990. And uh, that was various serious crime as well as quality of life crime. Right. So what did you do then to clean up it was, you know, it was, the, the subway? It was very easy. It's exactly what the transit police now in 2023 are doing in New York once again. And surprise, surprise, the success they're having is crime is going down and quality of life is improving. We focused first on fare evasion. And fare evasion was $1.15 theft of service. The cops did not want to enforce it. They thought they were just protecting the revenue of the transit authority. Plus, they would be tied up anywhere from 12 to 24 hours processing that fare evasion arrest. We structured it so that we put teams of officers working together, supervised, and we would arrest 10 or 15 or 20 fare evaders, hold them together, and then bring them upstairs, and we created what we called a bust bus. It was a specially equipped bus where we could process the prisoners right there at the station. Seven out of 10 could be released immediately because they had no record, so we could effectively give them desk appearance tickets. But three out of 10 were found to be wanted on warrants mm -hmm. or, in many instances, carrying weapons. So the figure we used back in 1990 was one out of every 21 we arrested had some type of weapon on them, and one out of every seven had a warrant outstanding, usually for a previous transit offense. So the beauty of what we were doing was the public saw for the first time in 20 years, the police were actively going after the fair beaters. There's one line of argument that is like, well, that's really what was the difference maker here is it's almost like it's, it's less about the public disorder perception of things and more about you're kind of creating a pretense or like almost like a fishing expedition to be able to stop a bunch of people. And then from that, you're able to find the people that have outstanding warrants and yeah. so forth. And that is really the part of it that's, that's having an effect more so than broken windows bro more broadly understood. Uh, yeah. Is there anything what, to that? What, what you're describing is the uh, term is called a pretext stop, that, mm -hmm. stop, that mm -hmm. you're trying to find a reason to make a stop. Uh, broken windows policing, however, is about probable cause. It's an offense, a criminal offense or a uh, uh, administrative offense in the case of the subway oftentimes, mm -hmm. that the police officer actually sees the violation. It's probable cause. He has probable cause. They see him picking the pocket. They see him accosting the, uh, the other riders on the system. So uh, uh, the, the far left has been able to really mm -hmm. uh, muddy the waters significantly relative to trying to equate broken windows policing, which is probable cause policing, quality of life policing, with stop, question, and frisk. Both of them are essential tools of American policing and need to be practiced legally, need to be supervised closely, uh, and need to be defended vigorously. And I'm a staunch defender and proponent of both of them. How, um, how, I think, how would you yeah. defend um, stop, question, and frisk? Because that seems to be the even more controversial policy where there's been you know, real constitutional questions and you know, rulings against it uh, because you're, you're not actually, you know, as you said, you're not intervening after a crime. It's the, co it's the police officer kind of saying, okay, this, we, I believe that this person is about to commit a crime and th doesn't that contribute now, to you know, ratcheting up the tensions? Let me explain. Stop, question, and frisk is protected uh, and uh, uh, governed by Terry versus Ohio, Supreme Court mm -hmm. case, 1968. Uh, we studied it extensively when I was in the police academy, 1970, because it was so new, that you have to believe that a crime has, is, or is about to be committed and have to be able to articulate the reasons mm -hmm. for that. And that articulation is critical. And what has happened in recent years, unfortunately, because of poor leadership, poor supervision, poor training, is officers are not trained enough as to how to articulate why they made the stop. And it's allowed in the case of New York City, where it was overused, well intended, but overused in the early 20th century. Could you give me an example, just a concrete example of when it, what is a good use of stop and frisk and what is a bad use of stop and stop question and frisk? Well, it basically goes right to the heart of reasonable suspicion. You have to be able to articulate why are you making the stop? And in city after city around the country, it's been determined that many of those stops are being made inappropriately. So it's given stop, 
question and frisk. Oftentimes it's called stop and frisk, but yeah. the, the important part of stop, question, and frisk is the question. You stop somebody, you have the legal right to stop them if you have reasonable suspicion that you can document, but then you question. And then the questioning basically may lead to effectively the frisk, the fear that the individual may be armed. So it's a, an essential tool of policing. Some cities have tried to claim that they don't do it. You cannot police any community in America without the officer having the ability to do a stop, question, frisk. It's like going into a doctor's office and the doctor's not allowed to ask you any questions about why you're there. One, one point that our colleague uh, C.J. Ciarmella highlighted here was that uh, in that essay, Kelling said that broken windows policing is a highly discretionary set of activities that seeks the least intrusive means of solving a problem, whether it's prostitution, drug dealing in a park, graffiti, uh, public drunkenness, and moreover, depending on the problem, good broken windows policing seeks partners to address it, social workers, city code enforcers, business improvement, district staff, teachers, medical personnel, clergy, and others. Do you agree with Kelling's argument there or, you know, clarification about broken windows that it's th there's more to it than the police need to be out there aggressively enforcing every infraction? That's correct. He has never basically indicated, nor have I, that you have to enforce with arrest every infraction. But you do have to address the infraction. The broken windows is never going to work with just police enforcement. It has to work with what did Kylie and Gunn do in the Transit Authority? Even as we were arresting fare evaders, uh, seven out of 10 of them were stopped, but then they were released with a ticket. They were in jail. They were inconvenienced for half an hour or so, but they were simultaneously cleaning up the subway. They were getting rid of the trash. They were getting rid of the graffiti. They were improving, getting rid of the, the on 6,000 train cars. They got rid of that graffiti that was like the hallmark of New York of the 70s and 80s. Mm -hmm. And so... There's with a partnership with the station masters, with the transit authority, with the police. Here's a ex prime example. The business improvement districts in New York that are so successful, Grand, uh, uh, Central Park, uh, Bryant Park, why are they so successful? They focus on cleanliness, they focus on enforcement, and they focus on furniture. The idea of benches and street lights, mm -hmm. the creative idea at Bryant Park of not having permanent benches, but chairs, because you can move around. So three or four, you want to sit together, you get a little folding chair and you make your own little group. You want to sit by yourself, take that chair and go sit off on the corner. And it's that creative thinking that uh, is that what Broken Windows was all about. The dotted line on the top is the incarceration rate in the U.S. The bottom is New York City during the relevant time period. And you see the divergence there. It actually goes down in New York City. So it's not Every obvious. year. Every year. Yes. So it's, it's not like you know, just locking up all the criminals or something made New York safer. And, and New York during that time period saw greater crime improvements in uh, reducing crime than the rest of the nation. So um, that, that's an interesting aspect uh, to, to note of your approach is that it did not require mass incarceration. So, some of what resulted with that lower crime, et cetera, was increased tourism increased jobs to support that tourism. The number, it had not been a new hotel opened in New York uh, uh, when Giuliani came in in 94 for years. And then you started having all these boutique hotels popping up. I think there was like 65 of them in the space for a couple of years. And I remember going with Giuliani in 94 down to the Southside Seaport, an international uh, meeting of real estate investors and telling them point blank, you want to start taking a close look at putting your money into New York City because we're going to make it safe. And we did. And uh, it, it continues to be a relatively safe city compared to some of what's going on in America. Hey, that's an excerpt from our recent live stream with Bill Bratton, who was New York City's top cop. He also worked in L.A. and oversaw dramatic decreases in crime. We talked about what's going on now, what worked in the past, what might work in the future, and how do you square all of that with the need for civil liberties. If you want to watch the whole video, check it out. And if you want to check out our recent live streams, we do them every Thursday at Zach Weismuller and I at 1 p.m. Eastern time. Go to reason.com and check us out.